becoming known as a fighting ball club. And one night in New York, they proved it. I was pitching in a ball game that Thad Tillotson was pitching in also. Uh, the night before, Joe Foy had uh, hit a grand slam uh, to win a ball game. Uh, so he comes up uh, in this particular game uh, the next day, the next night, and he uh, leads off with a three-run home run. So the second time at bat, Tillotson is still in the ball game, and he uh, throws at Joe uh, once, and misses him, throws at him twice, and misses him, and finally hits him uh, with the third fastball in the helmet. Joe Foy. Jim Lomborg uh, was a gentleman and still is a gentleman. Um, but the funny thing happens to Jim Lomborg when he goes between those foul lines. He his whole personality changes. Uh, he is no longer a gentleman. He is nasty. I think most everybody on our team knew what was going to happen. And the first pitch that I threw, uh, I aimed for just underneath his um, elbow uh, towards the small of his back. And it went where I aimed it. And I hit him. Woo! And so he's walking down first base and he's jawing at me. And, and I'm jawing at him. But all of a sudden the players are coming out of the dugout a little bit. And Rico, he, uh, he starts jawing with Joe Pepitone. Bang, where everybody went at it. I ended up in the bottom of the pile. Next thing I know, I hear a voice. Where's my brother? Where's my brother? His, my brother was a security guard there, right at the uh, at the dugout. They used to put him there when we came in, because, you know, be close to him. And he, <laughs> I said, what the heck is that? It's my brother Dave. And Dave, I said, here I am. I'm okay. Everything's okay. He's like getting guys off me. And I said, Jeez, Dave, take it easy. And uh, next time we came into uh, Yankee Stadium, everybody's looking for my brother. And we looked up in the third deck, way out in left field. He's up there waving. <laughs> it was incredible. They wanted to make sure there was no more fights and no, no more Dave going on the field. Red Sox fever became an epidemic throughout New England. And after a 10-game winning streak, the returning team was welcomed by a crowd of 10,000 people at Logan Airport. We're on the flight. We're starting to descend. and. Uh, getting close to Logan Airport in Boston, and the captain gets on. He said, uh, fellas, we have, a, a, oh, I guess, a little problem here. He said, uh, originally, we were going to uh, go to the gate, uh, park at the gate, and you guys would get out. But I got to let you know, there's 15,000 people at the airport waiting for you. It seemed like 100,000 people. Uh, we hadn't seen anything like it. But when we came back uh, after a winning streak uh, on the road, that told us that we were as good as anybody else in the American League at that time, and uh, that kind of gave us the confidence uh, for the pennant drive. The Red Sox were in a 14 pennant race, but thoughts that they were a most improbable team of destiny reached its peak one afternoon in Chicago. Former nemesis Elson Howard had been acquired from the Yankees for the storybook pennant drive, and it was he who was on the receiving end of a throw from the unlikely arm of weak-throwing Jose Tartable. He couldn't break a plane of glass from 80 feet, I won't throw somebody out from 250 feet. But that's the things that happen. Everybody contributes. There's a drive into right field, caught by Turnable, runner tags. Here's the throw home, and he is out at the plate! He is out at home! To me, and with all due respect to Jose and his effort, the, the real play was made by Elston Howard at home, at home plate because Ellie had to jump for the throw. He actually literally jumped up, caught the ball one-handed with the catcher's mitt, came down and made a swipe tag on, on Barry to get him at the plate, which was, uh, which was just one of those plays that we'll never forget. The 67 Sox got help on the mound from a previously untapped source named Gentleman Jim Longboy, who pitched his way to one win after another, 22 in all. But Lombard had that tailing fastball in the 90s, middle 90s. I mean, but he had what he had was the real intimidator was the curveball. He would throw right at right-handed pitch uh, hitters, and the guys would buckle or go back, and the ball would go right over the plate and strike out a lot of guys that way. Breaking ball got him. Tony Canigliaro was entering his prime. Now at the age of 22, he became the youngest player in American League history to reach the 100 home run mark. And comparisons were being made to the greats of the game, including Willie Mays. And then on August 18, 1967, tragedy struck. A fastball from the Angels' Jack Hamilton sent Canigliaro down. Rico Petroselli was the first to his side. I ran out there and I saw his face, just a few blowing up a balloon. 
just like that swell up blood was going through it. i said oh my god so naturally they called the trainer they called uh, the doctor doctor came out of the stands rushed to his side and i said i said to myself this has got to be something permanent the players all of us we were angry we were just angry that this happened uh to certainly to a young guy to one of the important guys of our team to a friend you know we didn't know right away but we figured we lost him for the the rest of the season and we did and he was uh, he was just such a great hitter but this was a well, team that hopped on the shoulders of its captain Carl and yes played like a superman Home run, number 41 for Yastrzemski and he's going to double play well hit to left and that's going to be a great catch by Yastrzemski but just seeing that I was in that zone, which usually only happens for a couple of weeks. Uh, you get, get a hot streak and stuff like that. To keep it for that length of time uh, really surprised me. Everything he did really meant something. Get a base hit, put us ahead, home run, three-run home run to put us ahead, win the ball game, make a throw from left field to throw somebody out at second or at home. I mean, 